I'm Ruba Katrib. I'm the curator at Sculpture Center. And I'm very pleased to have our three speakers today for the Unpopular env Environment, which is part of our SC Conversation series. We have TJ Demos, Martin Shreedman, and Kirsten Swenson here to discuss issues around the exhibition on view um, to a green for Garbage Bay. The show will be running and on all day, so you can um, pop by and check it out at any time that you'd like. It's open until 6 p.m. today, if you haven't seen it already. Um, I would also like to thank Marfa Dialogues New York and the Rauschenberg Foundation for their generous support of this program, and our neighbors at Sage for the sandwiches. Please enjoy them. Um, the seminar stems from, from and expands on many of the questions raised by Tua Greenfort's exhibition. The exhibition itse itself is the result of research that Greenfort conducted and various trips to Jamaica Bay, the marshland that ex extends from JFK to the Rockways. Jamaica Bay has a long and at times tumultuous history which has been subjected to the social and political climates of New York. And in this seminar, we'll dive into some of these complexities. So we'll talk about issues of desire, disregard, value, and other notions we attribute to natural sites, as well as issues around the, the idea of protection and conservation. And we'll also be looking at the history of art and issues in contemporary art around ecology. So first, we'll start with three presentations. Each will be 20 minutes long. And then we'll go into uh, about 45 minutes of Q&A. So everyone's invited to participate in that. So if you have any questions, please jot them down or remember them for that, that time so we can, um, we can discuss what you would like to raise. Um, our first speaker is Martin Shreedman, who's Distinguished Professor Emeritus of Biology at the City, you, oh, I'm sorry? No. Oh at the University of New York's Brooklyn College, and Martin has worked extensively with Jamaica Bay and many of the species that live there, specifically the horseshoe crab. And then he'll be followed by Kirsten Swenson, who is Assistant Professor of Art History at the University of Massachusetts Lowell. Christ and Kristen has a forthcoming book about the history of land use and art. So she'll be discussing some of her research around that topic. And then TJ Demos, who is a writer and critic teaching at the Department of Art History at University College in London, who will discuss more contemporary issues. He just recently edited, edited an issue of um, third text about um, contemporary art and the politics of ecology, and he's working on a forthcoming book with Sternberg Press. Um, so I would also like to say that we'll be working on a publication that will come out soon in conjunction with Tua's exhibition, and that has a text by myself and Adam Kleinman, who's a writer based in New York City at the moment. And before we start any of this, I would like to thank Tua Greenfort, the artist, for being here. And he will give a few words about his exhibition and, um, and some of the research he's been conducting before we move on to Martin. OK, thank you. Um, you can just take this. Yeah, so um, thank you, first of all, for being here and for Sculpt Center to giving me the possibility to, to make a show. Uh, an exhibition with them. Um, so I first of all said that uh, uh, this area here has changed dramatically from the first time I was visiting Scopus Center. And Scopus Center has been lately gone through a lot of changes themselves. And I've kind of, as art has been, been also part in, in those changes. Um, Ruba mentioned that my work was uh, about Jamaica Bay. Um, it is definitely about to make a bay and on some levels, but I have also been working with, um, let's say, we discussed environments. I think the place is a, a, a important um, to discuss with, with this notion, like environment is something that surrounds us, but the place is something we're actually within. And Sculpture Center building is, for me, uh, kind of initial for a startup, or let's say a, a dialogue both with the building but also the exhibition context itself and then taking um, a look at um, an area that are so extreme, um, let's say uh, has so many layers to it, uh, Jamaica Bay as, a, as both as a known place and, and as, as a place that hasn't really been uh, looked upon so much by a lot of people. So, and now there's a, a great interest in it. And I think a lot of, of uh, 
with the management plan of the Great Gateway and so on, that there will be even more people coming up there. But um, back to the building. So one, one thing I've been interested in was to take um, a phenomenon that are kind of uh, vital for any of us. It's, it's water and, and, and another one, time. So two things that I see quite abstract, but um, also very hands-on in a sense that the building itself is, is of course within a climate environment and it's raining over New York and um, part of that rain is being collected within my, um, um, uh, within my exhibition. So it, there's a rainwater gathering system um, and that kind of drives part of, of the, the project that I've, uh, or let's say the, 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 the sculptural kind of system that I've set up for, for this exhibition. So this is just something that I would like to, to point out that there's a, a link to, to the place and to, to, the, to the building itself and, and the city of course and at, at large. And then to go out into the bay and actually looking back to the city but also being there and experience this kind of, of, um, of um, very, it's, I, I, for me it has a, an impact immediately when I'm there compared to being in here. And these differences between places has been driving a lot of the, uh, the ideas that are behind the exhibition. So I welcome you here today and I hope we will have uh, great inputs from three speakers and uh, we'll have a good discussion afterwards. So, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, good morning. Whoa, look at all those people back there. <laughs> Sitting in the front, I didn't think anyone came in. Uh, welcome. How many of you have been to Jamaica Bay before? Oh, wonderful. So what I want to do today is to really uh, give you a profile of Jamaica Bay. Um, is this? Oh, there we go. So um, I'm, I'm not a casual uh, participant in Jamaica Bay. Uh, I've studied Jamaica Bay for 30 years at, from Brooklyn College and the center that I founded there. I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, I'm also an educator, so I have brought many students and lay people, uh, tourists, okay, uh, and tourists out to the bay to tell them a little bit about the bay. It's the most unique place. And as a resident, I live on the Barrier Island with my wife, Marla, who's in the audience. Uh, so uh, we have we have a lot of experience, and as I was thinking about this as I was preparing the slides, um, and as a youth, um, when I was tinkering between whether becoming a gangster or you know, a bright student, a citizen, uh, I used to hop on the back of the trolley and cut classes and go down to Canarsie Pier to do fishing. So I have a long history of good and bad things about the day. So, um, I would, uh, thank you. So I wanted to give you an overview for those of you that have not been out in the area. This is a map of the tri-state area. We have New York, we have New York, we have New Jersey, Connecticut, uh, and Pennsylvania. This is the bite area here. This is the entrance into New York Harbor. Here's Brooklyn. And you can see a, a, a little bit more detailed uh, map of the area. And yet a more detailed area a uh, photograph of, of the bay, right in here. Uh, here's the Barrier Island, and this is the inlet to the harbor and into Manhattan. So you see, there's a lot of water around New York City, some 580 miles of land shore interface in New York City alone. So water is very important uh, for consideration. Here's a, a satellite image of the bay. It's a chart taken from a study that we were involved in for a number of years. It's a Jaber study, and I'll say a little bit more about it uh, later if we have the time. But uh, these are the study sites that we use. And this is this is Jamaica Bay. Here's Kennedy Airport for reference. Here's the inlet in through the Rockaway Inlet, and here is the uh, Barry Island and the Rockaways. And we live right on this on this spot right over here, which is about 200 yards from the surf. Most of the time it's fun, but sometimes it's not. So, I'm gonna talk about some of the challenges. Uh, hope we can read that, uh, uh, some of the challenges to Jamaica Bay. First of all, the overpopulation issue. 
There are 25 million people live in and around New York City, 3 million people around the Bay itself. So there's a lot of human intervention. And I talk about a dialogue between the, the, uh, the, the people and the Bay, uh, an exchange of, of, of languages. There's major housing complex, exp complexes, and there are many more in the planning. There's a completion of a mega mall on the Bell Parkway, Kennedy Airport. Uh, there's altercations between flying birds and the planes from Kennedy Airport. There are three sanitation landfills, all are capped. When I saw the title of Garbage Bay, I was incensed. And then I realized that two was really right on it. There's three landfills. Uh, they're not sanitary landfills because they're not sanitary and they filled in part of the bay. So uh, we have also another problem here, a major water treatment plants. There are four of them now. At least 320 million gallons of water discharged into the bay. As a matter of fact, the only reason it's an estuary is fresh water is only coming from these uh, water treatment plants. And they really can't handle it. If there's a little bit of rain, a lot of this water is untreated, so we're pumping raw sewage on many occasions into the bay. Then there's the nitrogen loading of the bay, which is, I consider to be the most prominent problem for, for Jamaica Bay. And I don't have it on here, but for those of you that have been to Jamaica Bay recently, you know they're putting in a major gas line that's running from five miles off the Rockaways into uh, Brooklyn, and it's going through a national park for which there are no provisions, there's no firefighting equipment there, they're, they're disrupting the eco ecological part of the system, they're digging right underneath the bay. So if you have any questions, I'd be glad to talk about that. And dredge material, dumping of dredge material and oil spills. So these are some of the negative things about some of the impacts, negative impacts on it. Positive. So uh, Gateway National Recreation Area, one of the first urban national parks in, in, the, in the country, was created in 1972. We started our science uh, research agenda in 1980. Seven million visitors a year, probably more than that now. Uh, the Rockaways have become very popular. Jamaica Bay has been very, become very popular. Diversity of organisms. It's a spawning and nursery region for east, most of the East Coast fishes. 80 species of fish have been identified in Jamaica Bay and I do a lot of fisheries biology. 95% um, of all the commercial fin fish in North America have a part of their life cycle in the, on the East Coast and the Jamaica Bay. 85%, uh, I think it's 85% of people fishing in Jamaica Bay are doing subsistence fishing. They're fishing for, to provide food for their families. One fifth of the birds of North America migrate on their flyway north and south in Jamaica Bay. And unfortunately, uh, Sandy disrupted the fresh water bay, so we're having some issues with migrating birds not, not being able to find fresh water. Um, there's a Jamaica Bay Wildlife Refuge, which is well worth visiting, you should do that. And there's a diversity of activities, so we talk about people using their parks. There's fishing, boating, swimming, horseback riding, running, bicycling, bird watching, hiking, and lots of love making. <laughs> So this is, I'm gonna show you some pictures. Two talked about, I'm just gonna go back. Two showed you, talked about the connection between an estuary and, and, the, and the city. Uh, this is an old picture as you can tell because the Twin Towers are in the back. But one of the, my first trips to Jamaica Bay, we were doing some seining, beach seining, and I was standing knee deep in mud and I was able to see the horizon, which is New York City's skyline. It, it was absolutely incredible, absolutely incredible feeling to be in, in, in a city and to see, uh, to be diverse, uh, divorced from the city at the same time. What's that this? So these are some of the housing complexes there that have been there for a number of years, but now they're putting up hundreds of new homes on the Rockway Peninsula in the Edgemere section of, of, of the Rockaways. So there's, they're going to be challenging the already existing challenge resources of wastewater treatment and sewage and stuff like that. And right next to it uh, is a, this mega mall on the Bell Parkway that you pass when you pass by Erskine Street. And here is a wastewater treatment plant not more than 10 blocks from my home. Uh, and it's right on the bay, this is Jamaica Bay here. Uh, so there are four of these on the bay, four of these on the bay, and the landfill. 
Collect the garbage, New York City garbage, for almost 27 years. It is capped now, but, uh, and that's what the DEP would like you to believe, that it's safe, it's capped. But there's a lot of stuff leaching out at the bottom because it is sitting in the bay. So we can talk about that if you like. Disgusting to topic. This is uh, Joko Marsh, one of the uh, Marsh Islands in the, in the foreground. Beautiful island, Marsh Island. And you see what's right behind it, almost contiguous with it. And that's a runway from JFK Airport. So you have this, this very active international airport that's contiguous with, with the bay itself. Uh, I found that a center at Brooklyn College is called the Aquatic Research and Environmental Assessment Center uh, some 13, 14 years ago. We do all sorts of activities to study aquatic environments uh, and the interaction between animals and uh, some of the problems associated with maintaining the environment and also using anim aquatic animals as research animals. So here's one of our earliest trips. In this study we were looking at winter flounder, so we went out on the boat at a Kingsborough Community College, and we collected animals and assayed, assayed their endocrine system. I'm trained as a neuroendocrinologist. So we were interested in the winter flounder population. Here we are with my former graduate student putting oyster samples out at Floyd Bennett Field and collecting water samples. That's Chester Zarnock. These are some students that are putting out oyster, uh, oysters at uh, Fort, Til Fort Tilden at the base of Cross Bay Bridge, not Cross Bay Bridge, uh, Marine Parkway Bridge uh, to look at growth possibilities for oysters and the looking at overwintering mortality of hard clams. So this was a, a project that ran all winter long uh, for, uh, for three years, three consecutive years and also the summertime. This is part of Floyd Bay. We've done a num many, many educational programs. This is my colleague John Tanacredi who is uh, Chief of Natural Resources for 25 years with some students. We run a program every summer for high school students that runs a full month where the students learn about urban marine uh, environments and then bring do the experiments back at area. And here are some students doing some beach sailing. This is at Sandy Hook. Gateway National Recreation Area is not only Floyd Bennett, but there's also a Staten Island unit and there's a Sandy Hook uh, component as well. And this is something I like to do on the bay, that is sailing. That is my boat, the Harvey Lee, which is now in dry dock, unfortunately. So there's lots of activities that go on in, in the bay. Uh, you can't see this, and it may be just as well. This is uh, Sandy roaring down our block the night of the storm, about a little bit more than a year ago. This is our front porch, our front lawn, where the ocean is really just ripping down through the, through the uh, through that neighborhood and devastated the area. The, the interesting part about it is that much, much of the sur surge came from the bay side. So the barrier, the barrier island is only about three or four blocks at its widest point. So the, that, whole, that whole barrier was covered with water. But most of the uh, surge came from Jamaica Bay, from the, from the bay side, which is interesting. So here are some of the other projects we've worked at in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the region. Uh, the one I interest, want to talk about briefly is the Bay Jaybird study, which involved some 25 scientists and their students looking at all of the aspects of Jamaica Bay, from hydrodynamics to upland communities to fisheries to water quality. Uh, and we did this, presented this, and supported by the Army Corps of Engineers. And we gave them all this information, and I doubt whether they really they really, really looked at it. Three big volumes, each one was this big. I think they used it to prop, keep the doors propped open, but we can talk about that later <laughs> during the discussion. Uh, salt marsh, we've been interested in salt marsh restoration, and endocrine disrupting. How many of you know about endocrine disrupting chemicals, right? So we have these major, <clears throat> we have these major uh, sewage plants pumping out these chemicals that behave like hormones. They're not hormones. And we've noticed over the year that there's been a, gen a shift in gender of the winter flounder. With, there's a feminization of, of, of the males now, and we can talk about that too if you like. Uh, unfortunately, you can't see this, but Two has a great exhibit of these horseshoe crabs. This is uh, Plum Beach, 
This is on the northern part of, of the bay. But what you see here, these little dots, are unfortunately, you can see thousands, hundreds of horseshoe crabs in their annual migration every spring. Late spring, May, June, July, they come up. They've been doing it for 420 million years. Talk about resiliency. They've been there every year. I haven't been there for all 420 million, 420 million years. And here they are in, in uh, nuptial ec ecstasy. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, you can't see that too well. But this is a female that uh, died on her way into the shore at the beginning of the season. And what you see here, we've taken off uh, the carapace, and what you see here are eggs. These are all eggs, eggs in the hands. 80,000 eggs, most females carry 80,000 eggs at the beginning of their life cycle, and they come in multiple times to spawn and deposit their eggs on, on these, each migration. And one of the things we had, we've had an extensive program of, uh, of studying horseshoe crabs at all stages and, and developing the aquaculture for it. Uh, here are some juvenile horseshoe crabs in the laboratory. And one of the things we're interested in is looking at molting rates. So here is an animal. You know, they have exoskeletons, so they grow by shedding their skeletons and, and growing as they come out of, come out of the shell. Uh, and they do that about 18 or 20 times during the life cycle to get to their size that they ultimately achieve. And you can see here that the, the animal is coming out of its shell right at this margin here. This is a project done by some high school students in, in my lab. And here is uh, what the students did was to mark the carapace before the molt with nail polish. So when the animal actually shed, molted, here is the, the casting, an exact replica, incredible, incredible an exact replica of the animal itself. And this is the new animal, some 40% larger than before the mold. Incredible process. Okay, so, so the other is issue we're concerned with is uh, salt marsh loss. And uh, if anyone thinks they have the, the magic bullet as to the cause of salt marsh loss, I'd like to have that discussion with them. There, these are some eight that a panel, a blue ribbon panel, uh, uh, saw it as some of the problems for salt marsh loss. And this is a view of the islands in Jamaica Bay. There's Kennedy Airport again, and up on in the corner here just for orientation, the Joko Marsh. This is the uh, refuge here. And this is the picture that was taken in 1985. And the prediction is that by 2024, that's what Jamaica Bay would look like unless there's some kind of intervention. So we were one of the first to work with the National Park Service at uh, Brooklyn College, and we did the first land restoration of Big Egg Marsh, which is right near Cross Bay Boulevard. Uh, and what we did was to pump sand with a dredge machine out onto the marsh to build up the, the level and then plant these, this cord grass. And I have to tell you, I pass by there frequently, and uh, it is doing marvelously well. There are many more projects that have been done in the last couple of years to, to restore uh, the uh, salt marsh islands. Okay, what about the future of Jamaica Bay? We have some time, right? Don't look at you. <laughs> We're almost there at the end. So the future of Jamaica Bay. You know, it's, it's I'm going to confess in front of my wife. Jamaica Bay is one of my loves. I think it's an incredible, incredible place. But it has its problems, as I pointed out. So uh, here's one of the problems. There's overlapping jurisdictions and interests. So you have the United States National Park Service, which owns all of the, the water on the Jamaica Bay. But the perimeter of the bay is owned or regulated, or uh, 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 controlled by uh, New York City parks, they own a lot of the land around the area. Private landholders, there's a lot of private homes on the bay that, where the jurisdiction is run by the, uh, by the uh, landholders. And then you have the city, state, and federal agencies, my favorite people, the EP, DC, the Army Corps of Engineers, who have their own agendas. They will do whatever they want and justify it uh, in whatever way they can. And then we have the scientists. We have the honest scientists, and then we have the not-so-honest scientists that are being paid by these agencies. 
So this creates lots of problems. So there are all these, all these entities working in the Bay, and heretofore there's been no communication, no sharing of information, or very little of it. And we're, we're trying to change that. So here's a map of Jamaica Bay again, and that line that you see is park boundary. So here's, here's where I live. Park boundary only extends up to here. And you see there's a, a Plum Beach where the, where the animals is run by, by New York City parks. And if you look at uh, Broad Channel, this is very interesting. I pointed it out to my wife this morning as we were passing through. See the way the land goes around Broad Channel? Broad Channel is not part of, of, the, uh, uh, of, the, of the park land. It's, it's a, an entity, it's a private entity, and they do what they want there. Most of it is good. So you see they have all these people that have a say in collecting data and make their formulations about what's, what's to be done with Jamaica Bay. And if you want to go to an uh, exciting meeting, go to the Jamaica Bay Task Force meeting where everyone ex expresses their views. It's, it's wonderful. <laughs> so here's something new that I think is going to resolve some of these issues. It's the new Science and Resilience Institute of Jamaica Bay. How many of you have heard about this? Good. Okay, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. This is an agreement between the Department of Interior and the City of New York, just very recently, this August, past summer. And it's a CUNY-led City University of New York-led consortium made up of many fine institutions. Columbia, Stony Brook, uh, National Sea Grant, Rutgers, the, um, the Wildlife Conservation Society, Stevens, and on and on and on. A big consortium led by a, a City College and Brooklyn College to some extent for doing cutting edge research. So studies of stability and resilience and the management of ecosystems towards these ends. So how do, you, how do you protect these estuaries? What are the problems? What are the issues? What is that we can do to prevent this onslaught of another storm, climate change, sea level rise, all of the issues that we're gonna be confronted with in the next couple of years. And what I find particularly exciting is that not only will the natural scientists be involved, but the social scientists and the lay people, the community people, will have an input into this. And this is so, so vital, so important, because most of the time we talk to ourselves. But if you go out there and you have a, a mixed um, audience, you're talking to people that live there, you talk about people that work there, you talk about people that, uh, that, are, that earn a livelihood in the Bay. You get a different perspective. There's a dialogue that, that's much more meaningful than if I sit down with three biologists um, and, and talk about the issues. So uh, local stakeholders will be included in the discussion and planning. First, it will be based at Brooklyn College, and then we'll move to Jamaica, to, uh, Jamaica Bay to Floyd Bennett Airfield, which has lots of empty buildings that, <clears throat> that can be used. So, we go back one? Thanks. So, this is uh, John Tanacritti again in his book, Gateway, uh, Visitor's Companion, if you can still get that. Nice history of Jamaica Bay, nice photographs. So, the quote I'd like to read to you, unique to Gateway is its location, a place where the open Atlantic beats the land, where the salt waters of the ocean mix with brackish waters of the bay and fresh waters of the rivers and streams, the estuarine ecosystem is rich and complex, a place both fragile and resilient. And I would add to that, highly dynamic, constantly changing. And here is a uh, last slide of sunset at the Gateway Marina in Jamaica Bay. Thank you so much. Thank um, the generous space, uh, the nest seekers. It's a real estate office that's letting us use their space, but unfortunately, we cannot turn off the pink lights that they have on all the time. <laughs> so, hello. Um, I'm going to be sitting because I'm reading from my computer, so I, I hope that that doesn't uh, affect the delivery. But. This is going to be a very different talk. I am an art historian, so I'm speaking from the perspective of looking at, at uh, instances of environmental art from the 60s and 70s in particular. 
And I know that many people here will be familiar with a lot of the work that I'll be showing, but I'm hoping to weave it together in a way that might illuminate issues of, of sort of glimmerings of environmental consciousness and art in the 60s and 70s and how these, um, how this attitude toward art and ecology changed and uh, evolved into what it is in this wonderful exhibition of two A's today. So, um, oh, I'm controlling this, right? I'm calling my talk um, Swamps, Dumps, Slums, and Sludge, Navigating the Unpopular Environment. Why are certain natural spaces accorded the privilege of purity, both in a symbolic and real sense, while others are relegated to wastelands, backwaters, or waterfront slums, as Robert Mo Moses warned might happen to Jamaica Bay back in the 1950s? My discussion today will focus on themes of, how, of pollution and purity, how these have been taken up by artists who work not uh, who, excuse me, whose work not only reveals the often invisible politics of land use, but implicates us in the creation of our environment. Pollution and purity are matters of environmental justice. Who has access to clean air and water and open space? In urban areas, New York City in particular, degraded landscapes, brownfields, dumps, an urban park built atop a waste treatment plant in Harlem, or a nitrogen-saturated body of water like Jamaica Bay, surrounded by sewage plants, often correlate with proximity, if not accessibility, environmental proximity to poor and working class residents disproportionately. Natural spaces, and, uh, natural spaces are social and economic formations, creations of human interest as much as environmental circumstance. I want to start with probably a sort of unexpected image here a popular image of a popular environment in contrast to today's theme of the unpopular environment. As our historian Rosalind Deutsch argued in her 1996 book Evictions, Art and Spatial Politics, space is, quote, political, inseparable from the conflicts and uneven social relations that structure specific societies at specific historical moments. Deutsch attacks smooth, coherent images of social space forwarded by what she calls authoritarian strategies, whether from politicians, wilderness advocates, city planners, real estate developers, or romantic landscape painters or photographers. She attacks these for their concealment of the, quote, conflict, heterogeneity, and particularity that goes into the making of all social spaces. Deutsch calls instead for a democratic social politi spatial politics that begins with the recognition that all spaces are produced and structured by conflicts. Ansel Adams is, of course, a famous instance of such a coherent image, an exceptionally partial view of natural space. Adams' photograph of El Capitan at Yosemite occludes all questions. How is the space created? How does it change? For whom does it exist and why? Who owns and uses this space? Adams reminds us of what the ideal of nature was at the, in the modern period. Hygienic wilderness, worlds apart from the crowded and unsanitary tenements of the Lower East Side. Myths of Western landscape empty of Native Americans that encouraged westward expansion. In the 19th century, national parks like Yosemite and Yellowstone were defensive realms formed in reaction to the modern industrial world, embodying an, an optimistic spirit of manifest destiny. As critic Andy Grunberg wrote in 1984, quote, in Adam's universe, the moon seems always to be rising and the storms always to be clearing. Adams shows us a natural world so precisely ordered and so cleansed of ills that we might suspect it had been sanitized by a cosmic disinfecting agent in advance of the photographer's appearance on the scene. Mm -hmm. Yet even as Adams shot El Capitan in 1968, and I chose an intentionally late image by Adams, a park ranger at Yosemite offered a very different sketch to the media. Quote, Yosemite Valley today is a fair-sized city of 40 to 60,000 people, complete with smog, crime, juvenile delinquency, parking problems, traffic snarls, rush hours, gang warfare, slums, and urban sprawl. Bruce Davidson's eye was drawn to a decidedly different Yosemite ecosystem. 
a new generation of photographers had no compunction about framing the commodification of nature Yosemite represented, as well as the status of the park as a destination for white working class America, given its proximity to major urban centers. In Rondell Partridge's photograph, Pave It and Paint It Green, the majestic half dome is reduced to dramatic scenery behind a shopping mall sized parking lot. Yet, these responses are also partial. We, the viewer, are framed out, as is the photographer and the, or the artist. More recently, many artists have considered questions of environment, the politics of parks, the rules governing the aesthetics of nature, in ways that collapse the frame, entangling themselves and us in an ecological system. Many research-based representational performative practices emerged in the late 60s and 70s in order to reveal the social significance of hidden or normalized features inscribed in the land. Artists have asked a set of evolving questions since then. In what ways is land formed over the course of geological time, also contemporary and temporal, formed by the conditions of the present? How do environmental and economic structures correlate? And more recently, how can climate change be represented? What about globalization? Far from the granite monuments of Yosemite, the industrial marshlands around New York City are disoriented landscapes, as Robert Smithson and Nancy Holt demonstrated by getting lost in the reeds of the New Jersey Meadowlands in their 1971 film Swamp. Planes from Newark drown out their communications as they attempt to get their bearings. Head into that clump over there, over that or toward the puddle. Toward that clearing are some of Smithson's futile instructions to the camerawoman Holt in navigating the largely featureless terrain. These industrial marshlands, monumental dumps in the case of the Meadowlands, of course, lack cultural inscriptions of beauty and certainly don't fit within ideals of nature. The architect and sculptor Tony Smith narrated his drive on the unfinished New Jersey Turnpike through the Meadowlands in the late 1950s. Quote, the landscape of the flats, rimmed by hills in the distance but punctuated by stacks, towers, fumes, and colored lights. The road and much of the landscape was artificial, and yet it couldn't be called a work of art. The experience on the road was something mapped out but not socially recognized. I thought to myself, it ought to be clear that's the end of art. Most paintings look pretty pictorial after that. There's no way you can frame it, you just have to experience it. I'm sure most of you are familiar with that famous passage. Smith's story, storied revelation, associated with a phenomenological turn in art, sketches the absence of cultural narrative attached to the Meadowlands, to this industrial marshland that he's passing through on the turnpike. Um, <clears throat> It's an unframed landscape whose banality and artificiality defied interpretation, suggesting at least the possibility of unmediated experience. These marginal liminal places around New York fascinated some artists associated with land art in the 1960s and 70s. I'm showing you here a postcard written by Robert Morris to the curator Sam Flagstaff in which he describes <coughs> possible spaces he might like to inscribe as an earth artist. These seem to be places without particular value. Quagmires and swamps would be framed. The slight rise, flat-chested nature, so to speak, as he puts it, minus spectacle and sensation. Morris's 1968 earthwork. You can take a minute. I'll leave this up for a, a few seconds to finish reading it. It's kind of an interesting description, and rather early, too, in 1967. Morris's 1968 earthwork, created for the Duan Gallery exhibition, Earthworks, gathered a great heap of material found on the ground in New York City, dirt and debris, including scrap metal, and a fair amount of grease. The piece had a powerful stench. It was recreated for the recent show, Ends of the Earth, in Los Angeles and it, um, in Munich. And uh, it really did overpower the room, almost like the experience of, uh, I don't know, driving by Fresh Kills Landfill. It was um, a very strong smell. The piece is an agglomeration of the urban environment, condensing the smells and substances of the city. 
its processes, the urban processes of building and waste. There can seem to be two land art movements that are unrelated, or at least inversions of one another. Quote, isolation is the essence of land art, Walter de Maria proclaimed. And Michael Heiser's double negative, cited on a remote mesa well off the grid to the north of Las Vegas, was mocked as the art world's answer to Disneyland by Robert Morris. Get a sunburn, try not to get dehydrated, have an adventure, as Morris put it. Smithson had it both ways. When he constructed his iconic earthwork spiral jetty, In 1970, on a far-flung northern shore of the Great Salt Lake, he chose a post-industrial landscape amidst abandoned oil rigs, disused man-made harbors, and the abandoned Lucent Cutoff, once a major conduit of Western expansion. And I chose this aerial view because you can see the Lucent Cutoff down to the right, this very long uh, railway trellis across the Great Salt Lake. Quote, the site gave evidence of a succession of man-made systems mired in abandoned hopes, Smithson wrote. Although isolated, for Smithson, this land was not simply nature, but a layered historical record of human activity. Despite the jetty's notoriety, Smithson's engagement with the New York metropolitan area was perhaps most critical in forming his theories and ideas about land art. And not, and not just New Jersey, as is often emphasized, including, by the way, in a fantastic show at the Princeton Art Museum right now called New Jersey as an on-site, which is a great, I think, correlate to this show. Smithson articulated a nuanced conception of landscape in his last published writing, Frederick Law Olmsted and the Dialectical Landscape, that appeared in Art Forum in 1973. Olmsted, the late 19th century landscape architect of Central Park was an earth artist in Smithson's mind. And of course, not just Central Park, but Prospect Park and many other significant uh, parklands in the area. He was, quote, one of the first American artists to deal with, let's say, earth moving on a large scale if you consider Central Park as a large earthwork, Smithson told students in a 1973 interview. The essay opens by instructing readers to, quote, imagine yourself in Central Park one million years ago. Atop a vast glacier, you would not sense its slow crushing, scraping, ripping movement as it advanced south, leaving great masses of rock debris in its wake. Under movement as it advanced, uh, excuse me, under the frozen depths where the carousel now stands, you would not notice the effect upon the bedrock as the glacier dragged itself along. The image of the carousel, sighted atop glacier-carved bedrock, collapses millions of years, of course. This ephemeral man-made play structure situated within the scale of geological time. The passage, moreover, sets a visceral, phenomenological stage, reminding us of the bodily experience of our environments. Smithson saw landscape not as a fixed entity, but in a perpetual state of flux or entropy, a slow transformation through a process of dialectical materialism. Quote, dialectics of this type are a way of seeing things in, manifold, in a manifold relations, not as isolated objects, he wrote. The park, a fragment of Enlightenment era English pastoralism relocated to modern Manhattan, was a radical non-site for Smithson. Landscape was always already a product of social relations, and the park's in, and parks in particular were distillations of nature for humans. Quote, a park can no longer be seen as a thing in itself, but rather as a process of ongoing relationships existing in a physical region. The park becomes a thing for us, Smithson wrote. The essay features two photographs of Central Park, as you can see here, under construction. One, the top left, from it's a terrible image, but from 1885, as leveling for the northern half of the park was underway. And another, on the right, from 1972, with a graffiti-covered wall surrounding a pile of rubble against the backdrop of elegant Fifth Avenue high-rises. Such documentation disrupts Central Park's efficacy in presenting a harmonious, idyllic image of nature and social relations in the city, reinstating its convoluted history, the displacement of poor populations in northern Manhattan, the area occupied by Central Park was home to a community of freed slaves. 
and more recently, the 1970s era, spatial politics of racial and class divisions in New York City. Manhattan Island once had a desert on it, a man-made wasteland, Smithson remarked, of the, 19, of the 1885 photograph showing a clear-cut expanse that would be transformed into meadow and woodland. Smithson, like other artists in the 70s, took land to be neither pre-given, fixed, neutral, or natural, nor is something to which we have unmediated access. Rather, it's approached as an outcome and index of complex procedures. Mural later, later in Euclid's ongoing maintenance art projects are remarkable instances of immersion in such complex procedures. Her embedded status within the systems of waste management in New York City make visible the transfer of waste from your curb to landfills at the edge of the world, or at least Staten Island. As is well known, Euclid's is the official artist of the New York City Sanitation Department. Touch Sanitation was an 11-month project. Um, work in which, quote, I faced each of the 8,500 sanitation workers, shook hands with each one, and said, thank you for keeping New York City alive. The conclusion of her work with the sanitation department, she hopes, will be the creation of an, of an earthwork park on the site of Fresh Kills on Staten Island, that 22,000, sorry, 2,200 acre landfill closed in 2001, where, of course, the debris from the World Trade Center was sifted through. Quote, I felt that the classic American earthworks that I love had an unfortunate unpublic aspect to them, she says. Quote, they were isolated places and available only to a few who could afford the trip. The rest of us, there's only pictures. Almost all of those works were on private land. In New York City, there are huge tracts of public land on municipal landfills. Euclid proposes a cantilevered outlook floating between two monumental mounds on fresh kills. The mounds are filled with 150 million tons of garbage. If you lived, worked, or went to school in New York City any time in, in the 50 years leading up to 2001, she points out, you participated in building those mounds. They represent billions of individual decisions. She says, I don't want you anymore. You don't have value. This is how this earthwork has been created. Finally, Euclid's project embraces us as makers of massive earthworks through curating our trash. Such agency is also endowed by Lizzie Mogul in her 2010 project, The Sludge Economy, that makes, quote, makes visible, makes more visible the infrastructure of human waste, specifically sewage treatment plants and the social, environmental, and racial justice issues that are sometimes equally as invisible as the physical infrastructure. Riverbank State Park, which sits atop the North River Wastewater Treatment Plant in Harlem in New York City, and is very um, highly populated, if not popular because of the smell, um, was used by Mogul as the site of an educational event that concluded with eating a large cake, which you can see on the right, which is also a map showing the locations of all the sewage treatment plants around the city. By eating her cake, participants viscerally understood their own role in the cycle of sewage production. We are all participants, both Euclid's and Mogul's say. There is no outside anymore in this formation of critique, just as we're all custodians of Jamaica Bay and the environments in which we participate. That's the end. Thank you. Uh, it, it's been, become somewhat of a cliche in artistic discourse and ecological circles alike to, to say we're now living in an era where nature can no longer be thought of as separate, uh, external or isolated, um, as if it's uncontaminated from human activities. Um, against such externalist arguments, it's become commonplace to assume that we've entered a new phase where humanity is conceived as fully integral to nature. Uh, for example, this comes up uh, as soon as we mention the, the word Anthropocene, uh, right? This is the geological term that was introduced by Eugene Stormer and Paul Crutzen, uh, the atmospheric chemist, um, in discussions about geology in around 2000. And it's, it's become a really crucial term uh, within scientific discussion and also within the emerging field of the environmental humanities. 
Uh, and I would mention the, the ongoing research um, um, project uh, in Berlin at the House of World Cultures, the Anthropocene Project, which brings scientists together with um, people working in the social sciences and humanities uh, to ask the you know, questions about what does it mean to live in the Anthropocene? That is, uh, the geological age when humans become the central drivers of geological change, right? So the, the premise is that we've exited the Holocene and we're now in a new geological era. Um, so this, this notion of the, this, integration, this uh, integrationist uh, approach to nature uh, translates into the cultural and artistic spheres where artists have taken on a new approach to the environment that constitutes a rejection uh, of, early, of, of some, at least, earlier practices of the 70s and 80s land art or, or eco-aesthetics, speci and specifically the rejection of the position that the environment is somehow out there uh, and capable of being protected in some sort of pure state. Even though many of the practices, such as those of Joseph Boys or Agnes Dennis or Hans Hacke or Helen Mar uh, Harrison and Newton Harrison or Alan Sunfist or um, are often considerably more complex than what such reductions allow. Um, and I think, I think Kirsten's presentation spoke very much to this, that it's much more complicated, and there are a number of artists uh, going back into the 60s that, that had quite complex uh, um, propositions about the relation between uh, the human and the natural. Um, the argument runs, for instance, that by seeking to protect nature, by isolating it in its apartness in pure state, for instance, against the exploitation of nature reduced to commo so many commodified materials by industry, the cultural practitioners run the risk of repeating the very same conceptual objectification that informs modes of capitalist instrumentalization, which are founded on the human nature opposition, as if we operate in a world of sovereignty, over a land of inexhaustible objects available for our use, whether as natural resources or as landfill or as a sink for a waste. Um, so I'd like to um, outline three approaches to rethinking uh, nature that have come up recently in the last 10 or so years that add some further elaboration and sophistication to this discussion of just how the human relates to the natural. So the first approach is uh, that of Bruno Latour, and specifically his book, Politics of Nature, from 2004, uh, and part of a larger project of his that's been elaborated in many different places, uh, where he points out that political ecology, at least the kind that he wants to develop, uh, has nothing to do with nature. Um, so Latour is really interesting in, in the sense that he's been a participant in, in the emergence of this discourse that we could call post, a post-nature discourse of ecology. So Latour's problem with nature is that political ecology does not speak about nature, but rather with associations of beings that take on complicated forms, such as the rules, apparatuses, consumers, institutions, mores, uh, animals like cows and pigs and broods, etc. So nature is not in question. Is, is not in question in ecology. On the contrary, according to Latour, ecology dissolves nature's contours and redistributes its agents. Uh, in addition, political ecology does not seek to protect nature. Again, according to Latour, rather humans increasingly address nature more and more often in a finer, more intimate fashion and with a still more invasive scientific apparatus. So if modernism claimed to be detached from the constraints of the world, ecology, for its part, gets attached to everything. Uh, Latour also explains that if ecology ever claimed to serve nature for nature's own good, it's absolutely incapable of doing so, of defining the common good of a dehumanized nature. It does much better than defend nature, either for its own sake or for the good of future humans. It suspends, what it does, uh, according to Latour, is it suspends our certainties concerning the sovereign good of humans and things, ends and means. So Latour writes at one point, we cannot characterize political ecology by way of a crisis of nature, but by way of a crisis of objectivity, the risk-free objects, the smooth objects to which we have been accustomed up to now, are giving way to risky attachments and entangled objects. 
If nature is what makes it possible to, re to recapitulate the hierarchy of beings in a single ordered series, political ecology then is always manifested and practiced by the destruction of the idea of nature. Um, Latour explains, a snail can block a dam, the Gulf Stream can turn up missing, can turn up missing, a slag heap can become a biological preserve, an earthworm can transform the land in the Amazon region into concrete. Nothing can line up beings any longer, however, by an order of importance. So this is part of his development of uh, an ecology that is post-anthropocentric, right? It's a redistribution of agents, uh, including agents that are non-human. So non-human beings become potential subjects within this configuration. So political ecology for Latour, then, is a new ecology of politics, insofar as it proposes a post-anthropocentric assemblage of subjects beyond natural objects. Um, and one area I think that this is very, really interesting, really developed in an important way is in uh, the, the, uh, the realm of law, of legal practice, and specifically um, the development of what's called the wild law, or earth jurisprudence. Um, and there's a number of lawyers working on this, in, uh, coming out of, uh, and also in opposition to environmental law, that are attempting to redefine legal system um, according to a biocentric model of law, so that law can potentially work to protect, for example, the rights of non-human agents, of animals, of species, of environments, of rivers, of estuaries, right? This would be a, a completely new paradigm uh, for a, a legal uh, system. Um, so that's one way, that's one uh, direction that Latour can, can lead um, that's, I think, quite enabling in a political sense. A second position in terms of the reconceptualization of nature is um, from the area of science studies. So I'm thinking here of someone like Karen Barad, uh, the feminist theorist uh, with an uh, academic background in theoretical physics, and specifically her book from 2007 called Meeting the Universe Halfway, uh, where she develops the term uh, agential realism, according to which the world for Barad is made up of phenomena founded upon what she calls the ontological inseparability of intra-acting agencies. So intra-action is a neologism coined by Barad. And like the cyborg hybridity work of her colleague Donna Haraway at the History of Consciousness program in, at the University of California in Santa Cruz, it, it's meant to oppose any notion of individualist or idealist metaphysics, whether of nature or subjectivity. So for Barad, uh, in, in this text, Meeting the Universe Halfway, things or objects did not come before their interaction. Instead, objects come about by intra-actions. And in this sense, her theory is quite different in this maybe theoretically subtle way uh, from Latour's. Um, because her objects are not assemblages of humans and non-humans, as in Latour's actor network theory, but are rather conditioned upon an originary interchange, like the interactional becoming of bodies and bacteria, or where viewing an atom through a microscope simultaneously constitutes a material trace of the engagement of observation in the atomic field itself. Uh, and in this respect, her inspiration is the physicist Niels Bohr, <laughs> <clears throat> one of the founders of quantum physics. Which leads her also to a notion of performativity. As Bohr and more recently Judith Butler emphasize, that which is excluded in the enactment of knowledge, discourse, power, practices, plays a constitutive role in the production of phenomena. For instance, uh, when we separate human and nature, uh, that very division is premised upon the effects of that uh, epistemological, ontological decision to separate nature. And nature, as a result, bears the traces of the human production of itself as a concept. So, her, uh, her so-called agential realism, agential coming from the word agency, right? Agential realism is at once an epistemology, it's a theory of knowing, as well as an ontology, a theory of being, and an ethics which she calls an onto-epistemology. The question is then, for Barad, how do we reconfigure human activity upon the foundation 
of the intra-actional co-becoming of the world. Um, as she writes, any proposal for a new political collective must take account of not merely the practices that produce distinctions between the human and the non-human, but the practices through which their differential constitution is produced. This conclusion brings about a necessary criticality, I think, which is, this is where it's very interesting, where nature is assumed and such differential cuts are made between the human and the environment, which is enabling, ultimately, for a critical art historical or visual cultural analysis, insofar as it models a form of scientific institutional critique. Um, I don't have the time to develop that now, but I think it's really, this is an interesting area that can be developed further. Um, a third position, in relationship to the conceptualization of nature is that of uh, Timothy Morton uh, coming from eco-criticism and the philosophy of speculative realism. Um, and he's interested not only in the tour's work but also in the work of someone like Graham Harmon. Uh, where nature and culture are, as in Barad's version, uh, mutually imbricated to the point that he too, like Latour, recommends jettisoning altogether the term nature as a theoretical fiction, and also as a potentially ideological mechanism, particularly in terms of its so-called naturalizing operations. He makes a new terminological proposal um, referring to what he calls hyper-objects. These are real objects that are massively distributed in time and space, such as global warming uh, that extends hundreds of thousands of years into the future, or plutonium with a toxic life of nearly 25,000 years. So these phenomena, or, 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 or uh, hyper-objects, are so vast and so long-lasting that they defy human time and spatial scales. These are things, in other words, that couldn't fit into a landscape painting with its framed objectification, its circumscribed materialization of the environment. The environment being another term that Morton seeks to eliminate conceptually for its owing to its similar basis in the, in the philosophical idealism of the last two centuries, with its concomitant anthropocentrism. As he says, idealism is all about me. This is a paradigm from which we need to exit, argues Timothy Morton, and we need to do so through the consideration of hyper-objects. So this rupture from philosophical idealism brings about a sensitivity to a newfound intimacy, a flat ontology, where there is no outside, and where everything is bound within a mesh, another of Morton's favorite terms, a mesh of connections. You are surrounded by a hyper-object. You exist in a hyper-object. You are inside an object. The effects are immeasurable according to traditional conceptual procedures for Morton. How to formulate regulatory mechanisms to address global, war global warming, for example, when its effects will reach 100,000 years into the future, he asks. The aesthetic effects of hyper-objects are profoundly uncanny as a result and strange, like a fish suddenly realizing it's swimming in water, and when humans discover there's no such thing as nature, as if it's in and around us, interconnected to vast distributions in time and space. As such, we experience the end of the aesthetic idea of world as an environing, distancing and distanced horizon, as if we're living after the end of the world, at least in its now antiquated definition. So those are three positions then, um, Latour, uh, Barra, and Morton. Um, and now I'd like to, to close with a few, a few critical considerations of why in some ways they're enabling and um, very interesting and also problematic um, in, other, in other ways. Or, uh, they come with limitations. So one is a political problem. I, I think that though Latour envisages a new inclusive assemblies of humans and non-humans, offering creative ways of thinking about alternative modes of governance, wherein ecological sustainability and the defense of biodiversity and the rights of multitudinous life forms and environmental objects could be newly considered, his work possibly closes off an important mechanism of challenging the destruction of the environment in which we may very well be only a part. For example, Latour's post-natural political ecology appears opposed to the political movements around attempts to establish, for example, the rights of nature in courts of law, 
in order to, to protect against environmental destruction. For instance, I'm thinking of um, eco-activists like Vandana Shiva in the Indian context, or La Via Campesina and in indigenous communities from Canada, uh, the US, and Latin America. Uh, an example being the legal development in Bolivia in the law of 2011 uh, the rights that establishes the rights of Mother Earth in the Constitution, and similarly in Ecuador in 2010, um, where there's been a lawsuit initiated against uh, BP following the Deepwater Horizon disaster, filed by a group of environmentalists, including Vandana Shiva. Uh, and that lawsuit is enabled by Ecuador's enshrining the rights of nature in its constitution. So this means that we can hold uh, corporations responsible in a legally uh, punitive way uh, following environmental destruction. Um, so how are we con to consider the conceptual maneuver of getting rid of nature just when communities and social movements and activists and indigenous groups are attempting to implement legal strategies for the protection of the rights of nature? Um, these strategies of indigenous groups, for example, don't need to fall into simplistic nature-culture dualisms or anthropocentric idealisms, but are rather based in integrationist and indigenous understandings of the world around us. Yet, while seemingly opposed theoretically, perhaps they can be brought together. Uh, both the post-natural and the rights of nature parties remain committed to inventing a new ecology of politics that would redistribute agency rights and representation so that environmental decisions are made by a more inclusive, egalitarian collective. Both lend support to a different, more equitable organization of global governance, shed of hierarchies between technocrats and experts and corporate elites on the one hand, and disenfranchised lay people and marginalized populations on the other. My second reservation about the post-nature discourse, whether of Latour's politics of nature or of Morton's hyper-objects, uh, is the theoretical silence over what could be considered as the more immediate effects of environmental transformation brought about by fossil fuel capitalism and corporate neoliberalism. These areas are developed with much greater political traction, I think, in other disciplinary domains, for instance, in those of Marxist cultural geography, particularly, for example, uh, that of Neil Smith and emergent theories of eco-socialism by figures like Chris Williams and uh, Naomi Klein and Richard Smith which show how Latour's and Morton's approaches remain incomplete and potentially irresponsible even in their aestheticist speculations, particularly by their failure to address the recent commodification of nature in corporate practice under neoliberal governmentality. Neil Smith, for, for instance, points to developments like capitalized nature, nature banking, and ecological commodities first introduced in the 1980s, the beginning of green capitalism, and the invention of things like debt for nature swaps and carbon offset credits, which are not broadly seen as exhausted in theory and practice. The discussion of these things is completely absent in Latour's work, as well as in Morton also. So what about the financialization of nature, whereby biotic forms and Earth's resources are subjected to an economic calculus, uh, which, as Smith points out, is integral to the larger project of neoliberalism, where nature is reduced to a source of pure instrumentality and financial value, dedicated to creating new fields of capital rather than protecting natural reserves. Neoliberalism constitutes the key political economic driver of the globalization of fossil fuel capitalism that is re responsible for anthropogenic climate change, uh, environmental despoilation, and the worldwide growth of socioeconomic inequality, especially since the mid-20th century. Uh, the externalization, domination, and production of nature, for instance, in relation to biotechnology and now geoengineering, comprises what uh, Neil Smith terms the real subsumption of nature by capital, applying equally to instrumentalized non-human life forms and the increased modified biology of human nature. As such, the struggle against corporate globalization, I would argue, is central to any politics of ecology today, yet is left out, left out uh, uh, and is, goes unaddressed by um, the post-nature post theorists. So perhaps uh, this is where we might enter a discussion of Tua Greenford's work as offering approach to the way that hyper-objects such as global warming or environmental pollution and nature, natural resources like water 
and economic processes like the financialization of nature have come together. Uh, it's once, once we're aware of this assemblage, then we can invent ways to contest it and invent alternatives for a sustainable, biodiverse, and even post-capitalist world. Um, so that's the conclusion. The, the one, one conceptual contribution I wanted to also add um, comes from Peter Gallison, who's developed a really interesting hybrid term, which is uh, wilderness wastelands. And he uses that as a single phrase with a dash between them. And this is um, an attempt to provide a, concept, a terminological conceptualization of the, this, imbri this, Im this uh, increasing imbrication between the so-called uh, wilderness, the purity of wilderness, and wasteland. So he's looking at um, toxic areas like Chernobyl um, or um, other areas of, of waste uh, of uh, landfills that are gradually turned into um, wilderness areas. So, you know, it's, it, the, 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 this normally thought of, thought of as a, an opposition is pushed together in this term in a, in a very interesting way, and I think that that really applies to uh, what, uh, what Tua is doing in his, uh, in his practice. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Well, first, thank you to everyone for your great presentations. Um, and I'm going to ask a general question, which all of, or some of you can address, but I, I'm sure we have a lot of um, questions from the audience. So I don't want to dominate um, the discussion, but I'll just open it up with a, a question about value and this problem of value, which um, came up in many different ways. You know, green capital, um, the, you know, these credit exchange systems, and the connection to art. and contemporary especially as um, a phenomenon that is increasingly generating value um, and also has a role in gentrification and how you see that that um, in relation to art dealing with ecology but also larger ecological concerns and also how the issue of entertainment and recreation which art is also connected to but also is you know something that constituents are engaged in whether they like to use a particular landscape to go swimming or water skiing or climbing or whatever and how um, that affects issues in contemporary art as well as um, policy since we have Martin here also to address some of these more technical issues with with uh, Jamaica Bay specifically so I don't know if anyone wants to grapple with that first <laughs> you want to talk about land value? Well, it's it's uh, land value, use, and interest. So how how that's seen through more recent art, historic art, historic art practices, but also how that impacts and develop um, impacts the development um, the development of certain policies. Um. <clears throat> well, I, I, I would comment. Uh, about the land values, I've seen the uh, the Rockaway Peninsula over many years, uh, and, and I know for one, very early on, I wanted to live in in the Ponset and Bell Harbor, there, but from a real estate value, it was always several steps ahead of me. <clears throat> but I live there now as a renter. But you know, people talk about urban estuaries and parklands. People will only want to live there if the state of the bay is in, in good condition. They don't want to live there if they have to deal with the smell of sewage from the wastewater treatment plants, if there's floatable items where they want to swim and boat. So, you know, it's a two-way two -way street. So if you have a, a good, good uh, estuary, good urban uh, water park, like Jamaica Bay or the, or the harbor, People will want to live there. They won't want to live there otherwise. And just in a general context, you know, some 80 to 90 percent of the population in the United States are within a one hour's drive of, of a body of water, usually one of the coasts. So um, that, that, that's a comment I can make about it. I and mean, if, you, if your urban environment is clean and pristine and, and draws people to do boating and fishing, if the, if the natural life is, is uh, is um, uh, in, up to par, they will come there and they will play and they will recreate and pay for land. Now after the storm, I can tell you there are lots of houses in these areas that are still vacant. People are making hard decisions about whether to go back to these homes 
because there is a challenge to, to, to the area. It is a challenge of, of uh, challenge that they might anticipate from climate change and another episode like Sandy and a lot of people are rethinking this and new tax laws and things of that sort. So it, it's something that changes, I think. I would add, I, th I think it, coming back to the question of um, the relation to artistic practice, which is, which is an area that, you know, one of, one of its greatest benefits is that it can be you know, very speculative and creative and experimental. And in that sense, one of the most interesting uh, proposals coming from the cultural domain is to investigate new ways of considering value at the most basic level. Uh, so moving away from the value of natural forms, for example, uh, where nature ultimately is based within some kind of economic value, right? How else can we define uh, the value of uh, biodiversity or sustainability? Um, and uh, how can we recreate the conditions of a non- uh, non-economic or non-monetized value system uh, within the environment? Uh, how can we re-establish re uh, a form of the commons that moves away from privatization? These are, the, I think, the most interesting areas. Now, when, when, our, when artists are, are bound to their own ecology of commodification within their works, uh, within the, you know, the, 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 the art market, for example, that can be a real problem, and, and there's an inherent contradiction there, a paradox between any type of work that intends to have some ecological significance and the participation in an art market environment, that, that those are just, I think, ultimately uh, cancel each other out. I, I sort of wish that, uh, well, a couple of things. First of all, I think that there's a lot of, uh, many projects historically have revolved around this issue of remediation, which is quite important. Uh, Nancy Holt done a piece in the in the Meadowlands, remediating in the land, remediating in the landfill, and uh, of course the piece that uh, Meryl Euclid's Laterman is proposing for um, fresh kills, these means of uh, reclaiming discarded spaces that fall outside of the realms of real estate development and so forth. But thinking also of Agnes Dines's important piece that I didn't mention. Um, that happened, of course, in uh, 1982 on the southern tip of Manhattan, in which she uh, grows a wheat field for one season on a landfill that was created by the, from refuse um, from the excavation for the World Trade Center. The real estate was valued at $4 billion at the time, and she harvested $10,000 of wheat. And so for her, that was a very kind of subversive act a way of returning, um, or at least make, making a claim for the possibility of a value that could be created outside of the kind of monetization of land for, uh, for, for real estate and development in Manhattan. So I think there are a number of, of interesting projects related to remediation, but also sort of subversive um, interventions, so to speak, reclaiming of land, maybe even thinking of Gordon Mata Clark's fake estates, for instance. So that would be a good thing to. Well, my comment to it would, um, I, I'm glad you brought up uh, Agnes uh, Martin's piece. Um, I mean, it's, of course, it, 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 oh, sorry, it's, it's, it's kind of both ways. So she also takes back that and make that image, but that also creates kind of a, uh, after that, kind of like that ground becomes specifically more interested for real estate. Right, well, it became so. luxury uh, condominiums in right. New York City, of course. Yeah. And and uh, and yeah, the other thing would be to you know, also bring the question back a bit to um, value and and artists' kind of involvement, and to see how Scopus Center in in a future also with with the change of uh, of the institution can be uh, part of facilitating exactly that uh, discussion um, in terms of maybe uh, being more involved in uh, long-term uh, projects that deals with artists' interest to uh, specific places such as Jamaica Bay um, and not um, only facilitate that within an um, institutional frame. Uh, so um, that is two, two things and the other one with, with Jamaica Bay and the value there. I think what is, it's, it's such a complex layer kind of cake of, 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 of problems. One is of course uh, both military interests but also um, or let's say the, 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 the JFK 
itself, the, the, the airport. So this how you know this clash between having this major airport there and then a park. You want to do a park there at the same time. Um, I think this brings us together like a, a, a highly like difficult uh, value discussion. Like absolutely. Yeah, so. yeah and, I, and just to clarify, add on to that. I don't mean to say that value is inherently a negative um, thing, although I, I, I think there, it's very complex, uh, the construction of value, and I think, you know, one thing to consider is does, you know, how does art's value help or hurt or, you know, bring attention to certain areas or, and what are the ramifications of that, um, those acts or that interest, and so it's just, yeah. One, how, how, would, how would you define art's value? Well, I think, you know, art has long, value of uh, sort of a gentrifying power <laughs> or uh, has a gentrifying role in many different um, ways. I mean, there's, there's a, history, a history of this, but I'm, it just makes me wonder whether, you know, in New York, especially right now, there's a lot of attention towards, uh, you know, Sandy and the Rockaways. And so, you know, that's art bringing a lot of value to a certain issue, which is largely positive because you would want people to know about the impact of climate change and the impact on these communities and this landscape, but um, but I think there, you know, it's, it's very complicated, and so it actually brings a lot of. Um, I think I think it maybe oversimplifies or turns those enters into a conversation around entertainment, and you know, how is it possible to have a serious, sustained conversation around these these sites that implicates. The role of art itself in, in that um, in that conversation. I think I think that that's what we're doing here, right? Yeah. We're, we're producing a different kind of value, uh, where it has to do with social and discursive uh, conceptual value that we can realize in this conversation, and the, the resonance that the conversation might have in the future, whether through the publication or through different writings, or you know, bringing a, an attention. And Different, different kinds of interdisciplinary expertise to the conversation. I think it has, a, has an intrinsic worth that isn't uh, an economic one, uh, but could be even posed against in, uh, uh, that kind of, um, uh, uh, like this, that, the stock exchange of value. So I think that's, like, that's what I like to think about what we're doing here today, right? And what Tua's work is, is ultimately about. So I don't know if anyone wants to, to pop in. Peter. Can't hear the face. Why? It's like sun coming in. I'll explain why. There we go. Joy and I actually went there to the airport. As if you see, there. The major change that have occurred is that during World War II, and I saw this when I went to the library and did all the map studies of that, is that all this area, which was grassy, one foot deep, became 40 feet deep become a giant moat. So the waters come in here, stratify, basically die out. They had to do that for the supernatural the military issue, the airport being to be secure from any kind of invasion. The other thing is the runway extension, as you pointed out, has then created a continuous landing. Water coming in here can't get around. So you have two major disasters resulting from an entity you did not mention your list of partner parties in this area, the Port Authority. The Port Authority makes sure this moat is in place make sure that the runway is in this place so that the Jamaica Bay circulation cannot function properly, and that's been going on since 1969, which I think might be why we have the marshes in here. Uh, the other point is that, talk about hyper, hyper bodies, and we discussed that too, but the Vladimir current coming in here, hitting the coast of Jersey and bouncing off and coming into Jamaica Bay as you surge, that met hyper body is the giant water system that's coming to New York all the time and makes to make a baby the recipient of that flow, and that's something that we want to more yeah. mm -hmm. That's all I want to make in response to your statements. Okay. Well, but, you know, there's a, there's a lot of debate about grass and bay, and I don't know if I want to go with you, but you bring up the issue of how that airport was built, and it was built by taking land out of grassy bay, dredging the material from underneath and putting it out to create that airport, and as a result, the Army Corps of Engineers will always talk about borrow pits. Not borrow pits, borrow pits. And the idea of borrowing is to return. So 
I sail that, that bay a lot. And if you look at a nautical map, I pointed this out to the biologists for the Army Corps of Engineers. There are only a couple of holes, really holes that are 40 or 50 feet deep. Most of it is, is fairly, fairly within, 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 within normal levels, you know, 10 to 20 feet. So that has always been a bone of contention is about whether the water circulates there, whether it's uh, anoxic or not. Uh, and, and now the, the, new, the new proposal is to fill up grassy basin that can extend the airport. People aren't buying that. There's a lot of uh, kickbacks. In it. So that, that's an, an issue. The other issue that you deal with besides the winds are the tides. There's very severe tides and, and flushing rates in, in Jamaica Bay uh, that does a fairly good job of, of flushing. And if you look at the water quality for Grassy Bay over the years, only during the summer do you get really high toxic conditions. Very rarely do you get at anox. And I will use the chance, of course, to say that we, with Peter, have been out in debate, uh, and I've been there on several occasions, but not as much as I would like to. Um, well, you invite you back. <laughs> yeah, so um, I think we have a, kind of an open invitation on many levels to be to continue this discussion as far as um, logistics can do it. Um, but I'm always like in these environments, environments like want to come back again and continue that. Um, that discussion. Um, so um, I hope I also reach out to uh, Scott Center to uh, sustain that discussion in the future. You know, there's one other thing I want to add. For a number of years, I was involved with a group uh, at City University Graduate Center that dealt with uh, looking at estuaries in the region of, uh, in, in the context of economic development. And it, 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 it translates back to what I think you're talking about as far as land value. Uh, and, and that is, you know, people want to live in an estuary if it's alive, it's vibrant, they can earn their living. And many of the discussions that we had, and it covered all of the Western Hemisphere, from Chile all the way out to the, the North Fork of Long Island, is to bring together people like, like we have here, natural scientists, social scientists, you know, uh, government agencies, farmers that had no idea what mangroves are doing, they're cutting down mangroves to build homes and for fire, and destroying their own in industry. Of, you know, Growing shrimp, collecting shrimp for a livelihood. So, you know, I welcome these kind of discussions and, and, and very much attuned to whether it's art value or, or hard cash value uh, for, for, for maintaining these instruments. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to uh, ask you a question about um, an element of the Cochabamba Accord, which you're referring to, CJ, um, and that's climate debt. Um, climate debt is usually defined into two, uh, broken into two different elements, um, as I understand it, um, mitigation debt and adaptation debt. Um, and it strikes me that um, since Sandy, a lot of emphasis has been focused on um, adaptation, um, to the extent that maybe the unpopular environment now is, is mitigation. Um, in other words, you know, we, we're thinking a lot about how to deal with climate change and the potential of storm surges, but we're not thinking about how we can diminish the amount of emissions of greenhouse gases here in New York and other places. So I guess I, I wonder to what extent um, in the aesthetic sphere um, there's work on these two different elements of climate debt, and is there a danger of focusing on the kind of increasingly sexy topic of adaptation debt without thinking about mitigation debt and about the global south. That's my question. Yeah, and also just to point out, in Ecuador, um, now they're going to cut down rainforests for this oil reserve because they found a lot of oil there. So it's, even though there's those attempts to um, you know, make these sort of mother earth um, accords and laws, there's also you know, when there's oil, there's oil, so. <laughs> but this is very controversial, it's Correa's, President Correa's decision yeah. to do that, and, and he's doing it partly to develop the, uh, a sense of energy sovereignty within Ecuador. Uh, and, and you're right, but it, it's incredibly controversial, and a lot of indigenous yeah. groups in Ecuador are opposing him on that. So it's a big, it's a big issue right. that we can't really f fully develop now, but yeah, you're right. Um, in, terms of, in terms of that question about uh, different modes of climate debt, um, I think um, I, it's, being, it's being addressed, as far as I know, within more uh, the, like the 
theory and the discussions around climate justice. Uh, uh, and not so, I haven't seen this much so much within um, an artistic or cultural sphere context, uh, except within certain forms of um, like, you know, cultural environmentalism that, that are attached, that are being developed in relationship to the sciences in really interesting ways. So the, the danger, as, you point, as you're pointing out, is that we're accepting the scenarios of climate change and simply moving immediately to adaptation strategies instead of engaging the politics of resistance in the present. And that's happening, I think, more by activists and social movements in, in different areas of the world, all over the place. But it's not, I, I haven't seen this, that uh, distinction, as, as you're pointing out, develop so much in uh, visual culture or, or artistic practices. Not, not that I, unless I don't know of something, but I, I would be happy to learn of where that is happening. But I think in, in my work, I've recently come across uh, different positions that are, um, different artistic positions that are um, uh, moving exactly into that problem, which is to uh, rush toward ad adaptation instead of engaging a politics of resistance. For example, just a quick example of, uh, of, of something that, that uh, is, is a, a case study of this is um, in the Venice Biennale, there's the, the Maldives Pavilion for the first time. Um, where there's a pavilion uh, addressing the climate change effects uh, to this uh, uh, Indian archipelago and the, the risk of sea level rise. And, uh, and there's, there's a tendency within the exhibition, even though it's quite interesting and important that there is such a development within such a, you know, a mainstream, large-scale art exhibition like Venice, uh, but the tendency within the pavilion is to move immediately toward uh, migration scenarios, that, that the Maldivians represent the future uh, 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 climate refugees, that we're going to see uh, um, you know, it's really uh, increasing in the, in the next 50 to 100 years. And by doing that, by, by engaging that as a source of creative speculation, because it's so, it, is, it's, it is a fascinating eventuality, uh, but by but by moving very quickly toward that speculative aesthetics around migration scenarios and climate refugees, it's a complete uh, abdication of, uh, of a political position in the present to struggle against forms of, of uh, justice and, and uh, prevention now, right? In, in terms of uh, altering the, the conditions of uh, fossil fuel capitalism. Excuse me. Yes and no. What the, what the Maldives uh, are, you know, none of the artists in the Maldives pavilion were Maldives. You know, they were, yeah, but, but. Some but, of them, a couple were. But, those artists have just been reading science. I mean, wh wh why, why, why do you use the, you use the term resili resilience? Because we're beyond sustainability. We're beyond reversing this. You think the Maldives are going to be able to stay there? No. But they have to, they have to deal with migration. I mean, yes, we need to resist, you know, fossil fuel production, extraction, production, and all this, which uh, all of our governments have been negligent about, except maybe Germany. But, but it's cheaply too late already. You know that. No, I would disagree. I think they do have to consider these possibilities. But, for example, take the case. I, I don't want to. Uh, you think climate change can be reversed? No, but there are other positions, there are other political positions in the present to, to contest the course that we're on and not simply accept it and plan for adaptation. So if you look at, uh, for example, some of the politics of the Maldives, uh, as well as Tuvalu, other, other yeah. island nations yeah. that are engaging uh, in, uh, for example, legal recourse to sue the polluters of climate change uh, and also move toward carbon neutral modeling of their own uh, of their own nations. These are these are strategies in the present that are being addressed instead of uh, accepting what many Maldivians themselves criticize as a, a climate refugee subjectivity. This is a bigger conversation, but I, I don't know. We may just disagree about this. But I mean, you know, we have to deal deal with all the destruction that's been put into the environment. You're not gonna, I mean, Great. We can I'm not saying we shouldn't deal with the destructions put in, into the vine. I'm saying that we have to, we shouldn't get, give up on simply, you know, we shouldn't simply accept the course that we're on and accept that, you know, uh, capitalism is the only way forward. We oh, need to... Of course, of course, right. of course. 
But you, but you know, but those islands are not going to be habitable. That that that's debatable, but that's a, yeah. maybe a, a yeah. off topic. I think I agree with you, though. I, I'm, I don't mean to to, to um, imply that aesthetics are the closest to this integration of nature and capital. Um, and also, I, I think I agree with you as well. I, I didn't mean to to simply criticize Latour, but also to bring out the fact that we need maybe we need to push it further. We need to make it more specific. We need to relate it directly to, for example, um, corporate practice and the fossil fuel industry and. Uh, and, uh, and the, the ecology of politics, uh, where we have you know, corporate lobbyists largely controlling the political system. We need to talk about those specific aspects of the conditions of political uh, of governance today, which Latour, I find, doesn't get into. But he enables a broader conversation that I think we just need to develop more. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering if you have any thoughts on why he doesn't do that. Why he doesn't do that? Yeah. I don't know ultimately why he doesn't do that. I mean, I, I don't, I don't know. I wouldn't want to speculate about that. But at least you can say that he set up also um, within within uh, interdisciplinary um, uh, interdisciplinarity between uh, the aesthetics and the science, the politics. I mean, he's, I think he's working continuously on trying out forms of agency that can maybe facilitate that that kind of. Discussion. Yeah. So, um, I, and I find that that's seldom to see actually out of reaching out of an academic sphere, uh, also towards artists to take, um, you know, to, to, to engage with maybe a PhD on, on some of these topics yeah. and so on. So it's yeah, it is, it's agency. It's, it's enabling in that, yeah. in that way. I, yeah. I agree. Yeah, I, I would love to ask a question of Thierry that. I've been very curious about, which is to ask him to describe a little bit his role as as an artist working in a global context. How one selects a such such a specific local site as Jamaica Bay, and then also your work in Sharjah and other places, and how <coughs> what sorts of tensions between the local and um, global concerns such as uh, climate change and economics of globalization and so forth. How these are negotiated. Okay. Well, gosh, I'll try to keep this short. <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, first of all, I guess it's it's uh, it has been uh, kind of a long development of certain interests, um, and then also linking up to um, a tradition within um, within within the art. So you will have Robert Smithson, you will have um, Kielis, and you have. Uh, there's a lot of people who have actually been working on this for a long time, and I think my my work is uh, in a dialogue with some of those uh, those topics, but also long-term discussions. Um, personally, for me, it comes out of a I mean the interest at all to towards these uh, sites or the whole discussion about nature comes from um, partly traumatic uh, traumatic kind of uh, childhood experiences and also being involved in in uh, politics um, and activism um, locally, like stopping my parents' brigades and stopping a uh, landfill and so on. I have been confronted with parks and with restrictions. If you, you, you know, fishing is not just go fishing. You, someone will tell you not to fish here and there, and there's certain interests. Or you, you know, you, you think you are in this wilderness coming from Denmark. This is such a 
civilized you know, or not civilized, I would say that, I mean, barbarian in some points, but there's uh, a lot of, there's not this kind of notion of, 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 of wilderness. So you're always confronted with its, with, these, with its borders. So a lot of my interests in this come up from an intuitively uh, discussion around these themes. Um, hopefully on a long-term uh, discussion, both with uh, people around me with, and art, other artists, also with peer and so on, we will have, um, uh, I, I hope that can facilitate a way of working also with institutions that are uh, kind of bringing this somewhere and not, not just repeating it within kind of an institutional or cultural framing of um, some kind of uh, decor or something like this, um, but that there can actually be a, 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 a yeah, create an agency on these points, and I, I see the the discussion right now around nature, uh, the both these epistemology uh, discussions, what you engage in, also with with the historical kind of lines in it, um, is is uh, is, is uh, fundamental, uh, and I I I I I would see that the, the development within I see the development within the aesthetics are actually more important. Uh, but difficult maybe to grasp at some point uh, within a uh, climate change discourse and then to see. So um, uh, I see that, yeah, this, this, uh, this uh, uh, philosophical question of like how do we think of, of, of nature and, and rob some of those philosophical uh, strands of, that has been kind of making our the science we have today, this is this is definitely fundamental. So. And why Jamaica Bay? Well, Jamaica Bay is uh, important to to think of when we are in New York. Um, again, I didn't say that in the beginning, but it is it is just for me like uh, mind blowing to think of that we are in. We would have been if there wouldn't be the city that this would be one of the biggest park areas of of United States and. You have a uh, uh, Jamaica Bay that is an estuary that is uh, remarkable, I think, also compared to other other estuaries. So, um, why? In, I, it's more right now. It's more difficult to say why not <laughs> Jamaica Bay for me. It totally uh, uh, makes sense for me as a, as, a, as a place of of both engagement and also departure into some of these these topics. Um, also, because I've just come from making a film project uh, in Germany on uh, a river there that has been turned into uh, a sewage, uh, so it is really, uh, you can say, dead in most of its part. I mean, there's a lot of bacteria in it, but not that kind of, you know, of life that you would see in a river. So coming from there to, and then linking up to, to, to the exhibition here, it was, it was one of those uh, sites that would be interesting to discuss in a Post sandy uh, atmosphere and, and environment. But it's an environment. So. Okay, so we have time for maybe a couple more questions. Mm -hmm. you know, going back to the value uh, question, there's a kind of irony happening in the community of um, uh, ecological restoration scientists mm -hmm. because one of the main uh, main uh, concepts they're working with are what they call ecosystem services which is basically monetizing things like biodiversity, um, flood control, et cetera, et cetera. And they're doing that uh, in order to claim value for uh, what ecosystems actually do. So it's almost the reverse of you know, what you were questioning is you know, why is it, why are we capitalizing this? It's, it's so much the dominant paradigm that even the people who are really trying to do the most to recover it, re recover these ecosystems have to capitalize them, have to not monet monetize their services. Mm -hmm. The other thing is Platform is working, has been for many years, working on this question of capital. Uh, in England. Yeah, in England, not here, but certainly in England and possibly in the <coughs> You, you, meant, you, you mentioned the word restoration. That, that's always been an interesting word for me. <clears throat> that's how we got started with the uh, Jaybird report, the Jamaica Bay uh, Ecosystem Research Team. 
Um, initially, the Army Corps wanted to come in and restore, restore Jamaica Bay, and we asked to what? Exactly. So restoration is, is, is a tricky word. So what the, what the National Park Service suggested in collaboration with Brooklyn College with our center was to do an assessment of what we had and where we could go and what's real and what's not real. But they were ready to come in there and dump things and move things around without really having a, a true sense of what we, were, what we were dealing with, what's restoration, is it sustainable, is it resilient, you know, there was an interesting comment about resilience and, 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 and trying, to, trying to avoid the inevitable. You know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a tricky question. If you go down to the beaches now in Rockaway, um, and as I pointed out, I lived right on, right on the beach, they've pumped eight feet of sand that they've dredged from the, from the eastern end of, um, of the Rockaways near uh, Atlantic Beach. The Rockaway Inlet, not the Rockaway Inlet, the, uh, Reynolds Channel, and they pump eight feet of sand, and behind that eight foot of sand, they have an eight foot concrete wall, and in front, and behind that, they have sandbags, and, and, and I look at these things, and I said, so eight feet, now they're going to put another three feet on top of that, and I said, what happens if there's a, there's a 12 foot surge? You know, I watched the, the other storm come in, I was there for the storm, and they put these berms out, it was ridiculous, by the afternoon, they were gone. And when the storm came through later in the day, they were totally useless. So, you, you know, resilience is a good word. I think the idea to prevent these things from happening, uh, mitigating the, these things, is, is, is foolish. And you never know where the storm is coming from. You know, as a sailor, you know, you go out and you never know what you're going to confront. The wind can come from the west, it goes to the left, but you can move your boat around. You can't move houses around, you can't move land around, you can't move hogs around. We have to take a much more realistic approach as to how we, we deal with these, uh, with these events. It seems like we should live in boats. <laughs> Water world. My, my, my wife votes that down. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, I wanted to ask about uh, duration uh, of projects. So you made a really good point. Or you opened up the possibility that institutions like Sculpture Center or there even other sorts of institutions should help sustain some sort of very ongoing uh, interest in certain localities like Jamaica Bay. Uh, my question is, you know, what is the duration or open-ended duration of such a project? I mean, one legacy that we have to think about for Meryl Euclid is the fact that she has been the artist in residence at the sanitation department Absolutely. for 30 plus years now. And, you know, for most of that time, hasn't had this commission um, to do a work of fresh kills, which of course has been perpetually postponed by all, you know, just by the development of that project, I-9-11, and so on. So there's a work of, I mean, it's a, it's a duration of performance there, right? There's a work of infinite patience. Um, and a sort of flip side question that I had for Kristen was um, also about duration, or duration as it relates to preservation. To say something, I mean, the, the debates uh, several years ago about spiral jetting, Say where uh, it was kind of an there was an environmentalist move to mobilize an art audience to protest transformations around the salt around the salt lake. So all of a sudden there was one call for preservation in a sort of environmentalist uh, discourse. But then at the same time they were mobilizing a kind of preservation discourse in the way that when we talk about preserving works of art, or works of architecture, and so on. Uh, and all of a sudden, those two different discourses alighted. And they, that seems to also be something about like different notions of the duration of the work of art, how long a land art project or some project with kind of ecological focus needs actually to last for a mm -hmm. Well, um, should I answer first? I, um, it's, I think it, it's, it's, it's a very good question. Um, the duration of this has been very short, I would say. Um, but then again, if you compare that to what we're talking about um, as, as terms of like hyper objects and so on, I guess duration is, is <laughs> the question, right? So, uh, what time scale do we talk about? Like, uh, is it my lifetime or? Um, I mean, you, 
Kelly's work is is, uh, is amazing. That point that it really uh, grasped that that question so so on such a, a great way. I don't know. I actually don't know the story of how she came in residence uh, with the sanitation department. But uh, this is a, of course, in sense, kind of a, a masterpiece <laughs> to be able to do that and also continuously uh, go on with this uh, with with her, with her work. Um, so um, I'm just yeah admiring uh, that approach. Um, I think on a long term, I think in, in the short term actually some things are happening right now in terms of what we how we talk just from um, from uh, the inconvenient truth uh, from the stern reports from let's go even further back to from the Club of Rome. And up until today, well, there's a lot of echoing, but there's also a change of, 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 of language. And I think in another kind of awareness, both within both sides, also in the environmental, um, environmentalists talking differently. So it's not all, from my point of view, not all kind of really like, uh, I mean, it is still, we are really in, in deep shit, so to say. Um, my work comes out of that crisis of feeling that. Um, so I it's just like kind of continuing some of, of the more, I mean if you can go the very opposite way and that's very pessimistic but um, I, that's not what I see if I visit Jamaica Bay or if I'm you know wherever this kind of this life so uh, there's two 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 discourse to it but but I would I would say yeah if if institutions could facilitate that my I have great doubts towards that and I see more uh, that it's within initiatives from single as uh, individuals or groups, uh, especially from artists. Can you talk about the power plant? Yeah, I, I would love to mention the power plant. Um, actually, I, I uh, signed an agreement with, uh, with uh, Peter yesterday on developing a project out in the bay at a power plant. When we came there, they were demolishing it. So um, I'm... They were going to build a new one. They were going to build a new one. And they're gonna have a new uh, company coming in, and we're still kind of investigating what is going on. But we are we are there. What, know, what is this power plant? It's a it's a power plant, and probably it will use you know fracking gas, uh, the gas pipe you were talking about. Um, it kind of I think it's linked to that one, but there was not just so much talk about it. it was the East Rockaway after the great power plant? It was like, I spent months talking to people. Authorities, they didn't ever tell you anything. When we talked to the guard at the door, he knows everything. We got more information. Ruined, ruined, and have to get everything out of there, and then build a brand new power plant to have gas-fired power and whatever. And it's a giant site, 25 acres, and that dude would be that artist constantly barraging that with projects and so on. Mm. <clears throat> well, that's how that gas line got put in there. We object to it vehemently, and we still do. And uh, the, the the part that's in, uh, in in Brooklyn that's running along the uh, Fabish Avenue and into the park, uh, that, that didn't even require any approval. But the other piece that's going out underneath Rockaway Inlet, across Reese Park, and out five miles, you can scream bloody murder. Nobody's listening. They're already moving ahead. You know, it's, it's, uh, that's why I have such disdain for, for the agencies. They have a program, you can come back 10 years later, have the same program, they just don't hear it. If I could, just, I'm changing the subject a little bit just to very briefly address your, what you mentioned, which I think, I think is a very provocative issue about the preservation of the jetty. I think there's real entanglement of values there. Uh, preservation of art or preservation of the environment. Remember, this art was built based on the, the you know, funding from DIA, from the Blumberger. Um, family that basically um, uh, are the deep of the nils who got their money from the largest multinational oil field production company. Kristen, and Kristen yeah. the Spiral Jetty didn't have money from the DIA. From Duan. From Duan. From Duan. So Minnesota so Mining and Manufacturing. Yeah. So another extractive and it, it's now under the custodianship of DIA. So, uh, so it, it, there's a lot of entanglements I think. And I'm not sure that preservation was ever the point, first of all, in terms of the intentionality of the artist, but also just to me there's a lot of sort of confusion and contradiction when it comes to 
um, dealing with art versus environment in the context of these large earthworks that, of course, require lots of massive art tourism and expenditure of fossil fuels to simply get there in the first place. So I think that's a real, um, you know, a very complicated issue. There's also the question of duration, but maybe I don't, I don't have time for that, thinking of institutional involvement. Well, I think, I mean, maybe TJ could talk a little bit about eco-institutional critique, maybe. I don't know if that's a lot to go into right now, but I think it's interesting in terms of how, um, which I'm, you know, I think I just want to raise a point or open a question, which is, are we in the moment where, in terms of art, and making art exhibitions, and making art works, that do we have to acknowledge the footprint and the impact? Of course, but so it's, it's sort of like, you know, I mean, how do we consider all, do all art, I mean, of course all artists and all art institutions do not address this, and, and of course I'm not suggesting there's, there should be an end to this, but how do we, you know, is it sort of post, eco institutional critique in which it's just something that has to be addressed from the get-go and in every situation and all these entanglements as well. I think that it's a profound question. It seems simple, but it's actually quite profound and it really implicates all of us. Um, and if we accept some of the, you know, the proposed solutions that are coming from um, the more radical quarters, like that basically we have to enact a, a complete paradigm change of how we organize society and potentially enter into a degrowth economy and move away from the endless production of things. Uh, and uh, this, this happens at every level of society. You know, we have to ask then ultimately the question, what does that mean for uh, the institutions of art, of art production, distribution, and, and, and exhibition? And I think that the, the ramifications will be uh, massive if we if we think about this, um, uh, it's an open question. I'm not really yeah. prepared to go into it now, but I think it's really important to ask and to start thinking about. Um, and you know, ultimately, uh, it, it uh, pushes us from the position of being moralistic and blaming others, blaming the energy industry, and focusing attention on our own practices. And, and that's very difficult, and we're all uh, you know complicit in this. And, and that's makes it incredibly difficult, but something that we have to, I think, eventually deal with without, without at the same time moving into some position of a, of a kind of ethical consumerism. That's not the answer either. We need widespread uh, structural change at every level. Maybe we should, does anyone, do you guys have anything else to say? Something that's burning on your, like, get off your chest? <laughs> <laughs> no? <laughs> okay, well I guess we can um, end then and you know, feel free to stay for a little bit longer if you would like and have a conversation yes, among you. yourselves. Thank you. Thank you.